Hi everyone. So you should have already picked up all of the things that you need for class today as you are walking in. You should have a note sheet that's titled Hair Notes at the top and you should also have a packet of multiple choice questions that say like glass analysis exam but in my handwriting next to that it should say practice so this is not a test it's just some practice multiple choice questions that you can use your notes on but we're gonna start off by taking notes over here so go ahead and pull that packet to the front now I understand this is the first time that you've had one of my video lectures so generally what's gonna happen you're gonna see the PowerPoint run on the screen and I'm going to try to underline or highlight anything that you should write down or anything that's important as I go through the notes there will be some pause time just in case you aren't writing as quickly as I am talking, which more than likely you will not be doing that. So whoever is controlling the video, feel free to pause so that all the information can be taken down and then you can hit play again. All right, hopefully this isn't too terribly, you know, hard to keep up with. And I will see you guys when I get back on Monday and Tuesday. All right, here we go. First slide coming up. Okay, so today we're talking about hair. And the first thing that you need to know is what our definition for hair is. So hair is a slender or thin, thread-like outgrowth from the follicles of the skin of mammals. Again, just a thin structure that grows out of our skin. Predominantly our heads and our arms and legs, but of course there are other places on your body that you will have hair. Hair is a feature only found on mammals. So Reptiles don't have hair, amphibians don't have hair, only mammals have hair. It's found all over our bodies, our head, our face, our chest, our limbs, and of course our pubic regions. Some regions of the body and some types of hair are better suited forensic work for, for forensic work sorry, than others. And we'll talk about what those are in a little bit. All right, so if you need to pause, now would be the time to pause the video. All right, so just a reminder, I have underlined what it is that I expect you to fill out on your note sheet in red, so try to keep up. So now let's talk about the structure of a hair follicle. So you know that hair starts off as a root. If you've ever pulled your hair out from your scalp and you've looked at the end of it, you've seen a little white piece stuck on. That white piece is called the root or the bulb. That's where your hair grows from. That's where it starts growing. So hair extends from your root all the way through to the tip. Everything between the tip and the root is called the shaft. Your shaft is made up of three layers, the cuticle, which is the outermost layer, the cortex, which is the middle layer, and the medulla, which is actually in between the cuticle and the cortex. So again, hair extends from the root through the tip. In between the root and the tip, we have the shaft and the shaft is made up of three sections or three layers. The cuticle, which is on the outside, the medulla, which is in the very middle, and then the cortex, which is around the medulla. I like to think of it almost like a pencil. Um, if you look at, if you break a pencil in half and you look at it, you would realize that the paint that you hold on to right here, that would be your cuticle, and then your cortex would be this woody section in the middle here and here, and then the medulla itself would be the pencil lead, the dark section right in the center of that pencil. So that would be your three layers of hair, just like I've shown you on this layer or this, this section of pencil. Okay, if you need to pause, go ahead and do so. Okay, you have all, or most at least, of the, the major images on this PowerPoint already on your notes sheet. So this particular slide just talks about what the hair itself looks like and we're comparing that to a pencil. So this section here would be your root. That would be like the eraser on a pencil. Then down at the, the end, this is your tip, which would be the point of your pencil. And then everything in between is called the shaft, so that would be the body of the pencil. Okay, so now let's move on to talk about those three layers in a little bit more depth. We're going to start by talking about the cuticle and the cortex. So on top of your hair, or your hair, the topmost section of your hair is actually made up of little flaps that we call scales. So this, the cuticle has a scale structure, and that scale structure overlaps almost like the shingles on a roof, and it covers the, ex the entire outside or exterior of your piece of hair. Every single hair has scales on it. 
What kind of pattern you will have depends on what kind of organism you are. I'll go ahead and tell you that humans tend to have imbricate patterns. So this one right here, that's the one that humans have. So that's the one that's on your head as we speak, this kind of broken up, cracked looking pattern. Your scales always point towards the tip of your hair, and these patterns are different depending on what organism we are talking about. So one of the ways that we identify um, species or we identify what kinds of hairs we're looking at under the microscope is by looking at these patterns because different organisms have different patterns. Now your cortex is the majority of your hair shaft. It's the bulkiest or the biggest section of your hair shaft. That's where the color of your hair comes from. So inside of your cortex, you have all of these little pigment pieces that that's the only place you find them in the cortex and it gives your hair its color. So if you're red headed, it's because you have red pieces in your cortex. If you have black or brown hair, it's because you have black or brown pieces of pigment in your cortex. Okay, if you need to pause the video, go ahead and do so. You have these patterns on your notes already. So there are two main sets or types of scale patterns. The first kinds are called imbricate, which is the ones that humans have. The second kind of scale patterns are called coronal scale patterns. So if you're looking at your notes, there are three kinds of coronal scales. There are simple, serrate, and denate, and then there are six kinds of imbricate scale patterns, and those are listed off for you. They start with ovate and they end with flattened, and all the ones in, in the middle are imbricate as well. So this is the, like a drawing or a representation of what those scales really look like. But these pictures over here on the right show you what the actual hair would look like under the scope. And the scale pattern on this particular piece of hair, all those little white crack-like looking marks, that's your actual scales. Okay, and then this picture down at the bottom is showing an example of coronal scales. Okay, here we have some more examples of some different kinds of scale patterns. And just right away, you should be able to tell that lots of them look different. So because they look so different, it's really easy for us to tell if we're looking at a human hair versus an animal hair, for example. The last layer that we need to talk about is the medulla, or medulla, however you want to say that. So the medulla is found in the very center of the hair, and it's made up of a group of cells. So we always describe it as a cellular column that runs through the very center of your hair. It can have four different arrangements or four different patterns. It can be continuous, meaning it's one long line that's always joined together. It can be interrupted, which means that the pieces are broken off into the same size over and over again. So this picture here in the middle shows you what um, interrupted looks like. It can be fragmented, which means that it's still broken up, but the pieces are no longer the same size, like they're spread out in these little bits and pieces throughout the middle. Or it can be absent, meaning you don't have a medulla at all. When we look at your hair, there is no dark feature running down the middle of it. Okay? Now, whether you have a medulla or not varies from person to person, and it can even vary from hair to hair. You might collect several samples of hair from one person, and you'll find a medulla in some of them, and you may not find a medulla in, uh, in, in others, even though all of the hairs came from the original person or from the same person. You know, the medulla can also have different shapes depending on the species of the organism. So human medullas don't look the same as some of the animal medullas. And we'll look at some pictures in a little bit. If you need to pause, go ahead and do that. Right, so here are some pictures that show that continuous medulla and just some of the different ways that you can see it. So on this first picture, there is a medulla. It just happens to be a clear medulla. So you know it's there because you can see this groove kind of in the middle, but it doesn't look very dark. On this middle picture, this one definitely has a medulla. It's that really dark line right in the middle of your hair. This one is not clear. It's what we call an, an opaque medulla, meaning we can't see through it. This one is an example of a medulla that has a pattern, and we call this a wafer medulla because it has all of these little lines stacked one on top of each other. Right, so here are some more pictures. This first one on the left shows a discontinuous medulla or fragmented medulla. 
where it's just broken off into chunks or pieces. This one appears bubbly, almost like the, the pigments laid down in sections or in bubbles one on top of each other. And then this one shows, again, absent medulla, no medulla present, hard to see it at all. So now that we've talked about the three layers of hair, let's go ahead and talk about the three parts to an entire piece of hair, starting with the part that grows out of your skull, which is the root. So the root and the cells that are around the root make up the hair follicle, and this is where your hair grows from. It provides everything necessary for your hair to grow and for it to continue to grow. When you pull your hairs out individually, there are times where you will pull the entire root out still attached to the hair. So that's what this picture right here shows. All of this like white or clearish looking material, that is the root of this particular hair. Um, when it leaves behind tissue the way this one has done, that tissue is called a follicular tag. We can actually analyze this piece of tissue for DNA and we can then pair that hair to an individual person. So normally, hair is just class evidence. We go based on appearance, we go based on color, and we can narrow it down to a bunch of people that have the same colored hair, a bunch of redheads or a bunch of people with dark hair or a bunch of people with blonde hair. But as soon as you attach tissue to it that we can get DNA from, this hair has now become individual evidence because I can pinpoint this hair to a specific person. If you need to pause, feel free to do it. So hair goes through three stages of growth, um, and the three stages are all dependent on the root of the hair. So the first stage is called anagen, or an anagen root, and this is where your hair is actively growing. The hair, it's normally ribbon-like, it's kind of flat and thin, and it normally has follicular material attached. It has a follicular tag. We also have a stage that's called catagen. Oh, by the way, sorry, you are writing down the names of the stages. I forgot to underline those. Okay, so the second stage is called catagen root or catagen growth, and this is your intermediate stage of growth. And then your last stage of growth is called the telogen root, and this is what we call the resting stage. In this stage, your root tends to have a bulb-like shape to it. So if you look at the pictures, this is telogen right here. So this would be your bulb-like root. And it has very little pigment close to the root itself. And there's a lot of these little dark dots, which are called cortical fuci. Now, oftentimes we can tell if a hair has come from a decomposing body based on the appearance of the hair very close to the root. Hairs that are still attached to bodies that have been dead and decomposing take on a feature that is called a po post-mortem root band. It's also known as dead man's root. And it's just a dark band or a dark section of the hair really close to the root. And it only happens if that hair was attached to a body that was dead and decomposing. So on this picture, it would be this dark section right here. And then right there. Okay, so now that we know some background information about hair, let's talk about its application to forensics. So the first thing that you want to do after you've collected your sample is we're going to compare our samples from our crime scene. If we have suspect samples, we want to compare that to our crime scene. If we have known samples, we want to compare that to our crime scene as well. The tool we use to do this is called a comparison microscope. So it looks like two regular microscopes that are attached to each other by like this nose piece or bridge, which is where you would look through. When you look through these eyepieces, in your right eye, you'll be able to see what's on this right scope. And in your left eye, you'll be able to see what's on this left scope so that it lines up the samples side by side together. What forensic scientists are most interested in, in in getting information on or in matching would be the color, the length, and the diameter of the hair in question. By looking at the hairs under the microscope, we can look for certain features that will tell us whether we're looking at a human hair or whether we're looking at an animal hair. Okay, along with color and all of that, 
The other thing that we would be paying attention to when we look at these hairs under the microscope would be the scale structure or pattern, something called a medullary index, which just means how much space does your medulla take up in your hair, and the shape of the medulla. Is it continuous, fragmented, discontinuous? All of these things would be helpful in identifying the hair as being either animal or being human. Other important features, especially for human hairs, would be either the presence or absence of a medulla. We tend to either have them or not have them. The distribution, the shape and the color, and the intensity of the pigments that we can see in that cortex region. The only issue with this is looking at these things under the microscope tends to be really, really subjective, and it depends on how skillful your analyst is. The more hairs they've studied, the better they are at identifying certain features. If they are brand new to the job, they're going to make a lot of rookie mistakes very early on. The same would be true for you guys. When we start doing our hair labs, initially, you're not going to be able to see certain things, but after you've done it for a while, you start, knowing, you start learning what to look for. Okay, so you don't have anything that you need to write down on this slide because it's all written down for you, but this slide talks about some very important things. So while hair tells us a lot of information, there are some things that it cannot tell us. For example, we cannot figure out the age of a person based on their hair. We also can't figure out the gender of a person based on their hair. He male hair doesn't look any different than female hair. The only way we can perform DNA analysis is if we have tissue or a follicular tag attached to the hair roots. So without that, we can't, we can't pinpoint an individual. The following is information that hair examinations do tell us. So we can figure out if we're looking at a human or an animal here. We could figure out the possible race of the person. We could figure out what area of the body that hair came from. And we could figure out if it could have come from a donor of what we call known standards. Hair can also be dis used to distinguish, can be used, sorry, to distinguish between identical twins. We've also talked about the fact that, you know, fingerprints um, can be done, can be used for this purpose as well. That's pretty much the only two things that twins, identical twins don't share. Their hair will be different and their fingerprints are different. A lot of times DNA has slight differences, but not enough that we often pick up on it. The reason that you can use hair to identify between two identical twins is because of environmental effects on the hair. So for example, if one twin constantly flat irons and blow dries their hair or dyes their hair or uses some kind of chemical on their hair, that twin's hair will look very different to the twin that doesn't do all of those things. We can also tell a lot about a person's diet and their health based on what shape their hair is in. Okay, if you need to pause. Well, you shouldn't need to pause. We're moving on. So while hair can't point to an individual, there are three basic conclusions that we can reach once we've looked at hair under the microscope. The first conclusion is that the two hairs in question will have similar microscopical characteristics. So it just means that both of those hairs could have come from the same person. The other conclusion is that they have dissimilar microscopical characteristics, which just means that the two hairs probably did not come from the same person. And the third conclusion is that they have both similar but also slightly different microsc microscopical sorry, characteristics, which is inconclusive. It means we have no clue who that hair came from. These are the only three conclusions that we can meet using hair analysis. Okay, so let's talk about collection and preservation. Now even though you grow hair all over your body, there are only really two sets of hairs that are useful for forensic hair comparisons. And they will either be head hairs or pubic hairs. If you are using head hairs, then you need to collect 50 full length hairs from all different areas of the scalp. And that is going to ensure that you get a good representation of all of the different kinds of hair that that person has, all of the different features that we talked about. 
If you are using pubic hair, you need to do a minimum collection of two dozen, so 24, full-length pubic hairs. And again, those should be taken from all areas of the pubic region. Once more, it's all about collecting a good sampling of that person's hair. Hair samples can also be collected from victims of suspicious deaths during autopsies, like if we're trying to rule out you know, homicide or something like that, we don't know why this person died, we could potentially collect hair to aid in the case for that reason. Okay, if you need to pause, feel free. Okay, so for the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about how hairs show racial origin. Please do not turn this into a race war or a race issue. This is, this is not meant to offend anyone. These are actual scientific terms. You just need to learn them as they are presented to you. This is the only section that I forgot to put in some of the pictures, so I'm going to highlight which pictures I want you to like make sketches of next to your notes. Okay, so we can pinpoint racial origin from here because the three main ra racial groups have very characteristic looking hair. So this is what we're about to step through and talk about. We're going to start with the racial origin of Caucasian. So if someone is of Caucasian descent, they have what we call a moderate hair shaft diameter, which just means that the hair isn't really thick. It's also not very thin. It's kind of in the middle. It's of a medium thickness. And they have very little variation. The hair seems to be the same thickness all the way through. In terms of pigment, their pigment tends to be light to moderate. So remember, pigment means color. So they have light to moderate color intensity. And it's evenly distributed throughout the hair. You don't have sections of the hair that has more pigments than the, the rest. The part I want you to draw is this section where it talks about the shape of the cross section. So cross section means we've taken the, the hair and we've cut it in half and we're looking on the end that is cut. People of Caucasian descent tend to have oval shaped cross sections. So this picture up in the corner shows you those oval shapes. So I just need you to make a couple of sketches of these ovals. Okay, and that's to remind you that their cross section is shaped like an oval. Okay, so the next group is Negroid. The Negroid category has hair sizes that are fine to moderate in size. So really thin to, you know, medium size in terms of the thickness of each individual hair. There is a lot of variation, which just means that the hairs can have lots of different shapes, like twists and curls, like S patterns and zigzag patterns and, and that kind of thing. In terms of pigment, they have lots of rich, dark pigment, so their hair tends to be a very dark but vibrant color, and the pigment can be laid down in clumps in some sections. So if you look at this top picture, see how in the middle it looks almost like it's a slightly lighter color than it does on the edges? That would be an example of down here, the pigment's laid down a whole lot heavier, and in the middle it's laid down a little bit lighter. They tend to have what we call a flat cross section, which looks a lot like oval, except it's more squarish on the ends. So please sketch this next to that section in your notes. Okay, the last group would be the mongoloids. They have very thick hairs, like each individual hair is very thick in diameter. So that's what a coarse shaft diameter means. They have streaky pigments with heavy density. So if you look on this top picture, you can see how the pigments laid down almost in lines, almost like it's, it's painted on. And there's some sections like right here and down at the bottom where there's almost no pigment whatsoever. It almost looks like that part of the hair is transparent. They have a thick cuticle. And more importantly, they have a round cross section. When you cut their hair in half and you look at it, theirs is truly a round shape. So again, I'd like you to sketch this particular um, diagram next to your notes. Okay, so this isn't recorded anywhere in, on your note sheet, but we're just going to talk through this really quick. A couple of slides ago, I said that when you take samples of hair, you need at least 50 if you're, do, you're working with the head hairs, and you need at least 24 if you're working with the pubic hairs. And the reason we need so many is because your hair can vary from root to tip. So all of these pictures show the exact same hair, the same single hair 
on from someone's head. And you would, if you are just looking at it initially, you would think that these are five different hairs, but they're all part of the same hair. So that's one of the reasons that we take so many individual samples, so that we don't miss anything. All right, here's another example. Again, all three of these hairs came from the same person's head, but they all look very different. And then here's another example again. All three hairs from the same person. Okay, so let's talk about somatic origin. So the word somatic just means body, and this is just where we're going to talk about why we use head hairs and pubic hairs versus other kinds of hairs. So hairs from different parts of your body are going to show different characteristics. We choose head hairs because they tend to be longer than any other hairs on your body, and they also tend to be the easiest to work with because you manipulate them a whole lot more. This is also the hair that if you are going to alter, this is the one that you would choose to alter. So you might put dye on top of it. You might put some kind of chemical relaxer or straightener on top of it. You might put some kind of chemical to make it curl on top of it. You might bleach it out. So because of all of these different treatments, especially when they're done by women, it helps us to distinguish one person's hair from another person's hair. The other kinds of hairs that we tend to use are pubic hairs, and it's because they tend to be so thick that we can see a whole lot of variation on them when we place them under a microscope. They also showcase a specialized feature which is called buckling, and this is what this picture right here in this corner shows. Buckling is just where you rapidly change the diameter of a hair. So if you look at it, how, you look how it, it has like a section scooped out, like it's gotten thinner right here in this section. That's what buckling is, and it's something only done by pubic hair. Okay, so animal hairs look completely different to human hairs. And we can normally take animal hairs and put them into one of three major categories. And we do this via microscope appearance. So we will put them into the group of deer and antelope families, commercial fur animals, and domestic animals. Unlike us, animals have two kinds of hairs. They have fur hair, which is really fine and it's designed to keep them warm. That's the hair that's going to be found closer to their skin, and it tends to be softer as well. And they also have guard hair, which tends to be a lot thicker and more rugged, and it's designed for protection. If you've ever seen a hedgehog or a porcupine, those quills and spines are actually made out of hair, nothing else. So that would be an example of guard hair. Forgot to mention that you should be writing down fur hair and guard hair on this one. Okay, pause if you need to. All right, so the reason that we put certain animals into the deer and antelope family is all based on what their scales look like and what the shape of their roots look like. All of the deer and antelope family animals have what we call isodiametric scales. They look like fish scales, and this is what these two pictures here show you. And they have a wine glass shaped root. It literally looks like the stem of a wine glass, the bottom part where the, the glass itself adheres to the stem of the glass. So these would be some animals that we find in the deer and antelope family. Things like deer, obviously, elk, moose, antelope, caribou, that kind of thing. Our commercial animals are going to be the ones that we raise for fur. So when people talk about owning mink coats or chinchilla coats or beaver coats. This is what we're talking about. Animals that their fur is so soft and so luxurious that we literally raise them and then kill them for their furs and for their, you know, for their outer covering. So this is the stuff that PETA doesn't like us for. Um, some examples of these kinds of animals would be rabbit, mink, chinchilla, seal, raccoon, fox, beaver, bear, that kind of thing. If you've never seen a chinchilla, they're super cute. Uh, this is a chinchilla right here. Okay, and then the last grouping would be domestic animals, so animals that we have domesticated for our purposes, or either our amusement or to help us with our day-to-day -day jobs. They tend to have what we call amorphous medullas, and you learned that word amorphous when we talked about glass. Remember, that word just means that the atoms are not arranged in a uniform pattern. They're just kind of scattered all over the place. They have very characteristic root shapes, and some examples of domestic animals would be your dog, your cat, horses, cows, cattle, that kind of thing. All right, so you need to do some writing on this slide. You should have the reproduction of 
the cat hair picture and the dog hair picture, I just need you to write down the words underneath it. So let's start with the root of a cat hair. Cat hair roots tend to be elongated, which means they're kind of stretched out. They don't have a distinctive shape. It almost looks like you've chewed on the end of it, and they tend to fray out at the base. So that's what all of these little spikes are. That's the root itself fraying out. And that's very characteristic under the microscope. When you look for it, it'll, be, it'll look just like this. Whereas the root of a dog hair tends to be more of a spade shaped, and it's tapered at the end. It's not all frayed and weird looking. It almost looks like it was carved that way. Okay, so again, you're writing down all of the things. Sorry, the bell's going off. Here and here. Okay, you have this chart on your note sheet, and this just goes over the three main differences between human hair and animal hair, so we're going to run through it very quickly. They're different on three levels, pigment, medulla, and scale structure. For humans, we have a consistent color throughout, and it's going to be the same color from the root all the way to the tip unless we've dyed it to look a specific way. Some animals can change the color of their hairs as you go from the root to the tip. The medulla on a human hair is really thin. It takes up no more than one third of the space in the hair shaft. It tends to be amorphous. Whereas with animal hairs, it tends to be really wide. The medulla takes up a whole lot of space and it's very regular, very well defined and a lot of them have very specific patterns. Okay, and then the last one is scale structure. So for human hairs, we tend to have imbricate scales that are flattened and they overlap on each other and animal hairs tend to have coronal or crown-shaped scales. Some of them will even have spinous sca scales, which look more like petals than they do like crowns. Okay, so this picture really quickly just shows cases what that last slide with that table talked about. So we're just going to step through it and utilize the same words that we used in the table so that everyone's on the same page. So, let's see. This one is the human hair. This one is the animal hair. Let's start by looking at pigment. You can see that the pigment on the human hair is very even. It's like this even gold brown color all the way through. Whereas on the animal hair, it's a whole lot darker, way more dense pigment. We're looking at the medulla next, which is in the very middle on the human. It's, it's really skinny. It almost looks like you took a pencil and you drew that line in. Whereas in the, on the animal hair, the darker region of that hair, so right here in the center, that's the medulla. You can tell that it's really big. It takes up more space in the animal hair than it does in the human hair. Now this picture, you cannot see scale structure or patterns, but you can at least see the color and the medulla. So some other information that hair can give us is some insight to the condition or the health of the person that that hair came from. So on your slide, on your notes, sorry, you should have these three main diseases or three main types of conditions or deficiencies laid out. And I just want you to write down the most important things out of what I'm about to say. So on this first one, please note I'm not even going to try to say that word because it's ridiculous, but this just shows the breaking apart of hair strands when they get just really, really weak and it's almost like they pop out of place without even putting a whole lot of pressure on it. And this is due to either immunodeficiencies, so you're writing this down, immunodeficiencies or to what we call small bowel disorder, meaning your body doesn't process your food properly in your small intestines. <clears throat> okay, the next one is called pili analuti. I know that, analati actually. That's another weird one. This is a very rare disorder, but it's where the hair just spontaneously starts changing color. So it'll go from a light color to a dark color, to a light color to a dark color, just like it's shown here in this picture. Okay, so again, it's a rare disorder, and it's where some of the hair shafts just alternate between light colors and dark colors. Okay, and then this last one is parasites. Sometimes your hair is the perfect breathing ground for a bunch of different human parasites. The most common that you probably are familiar with would be head lice, where they use uh, like your little, literally your hair structures as like nurseries for their eggs. They lay their eggs on the hair shaft and then the eggs hatch. The lice crawl up the hair, attach themselves to your scalp and feed off of your blood. Real pleasant. 
Okay, so if you need to pause so that you can take some of this information down, then go ahead and do so now. So while here it gives us a whole wealth of information in terms of the significant role that it plays in a crime scene, it all boils down to the frequency of contact between your victim and your suspect, as well as the scene itself. So the more times you can find multiple samples from the same sets of people, the more it ties those people to your location or to your crime scene. You also have to think of what kind of hair you're finding and the location of that hair. So this slide just goes on to detail a few examples of this. You can feel free to read that through. <clears throat> um, you don't have anything that you need to write down on this one. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the last slide. All right, so here are our sources like we always show at the end. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, you should have been... You should be completely done with notes at this stage. Those notes are yours to hold on to. Um, I would actually like you to go ahead and work on the hair evidence packet. It comes with a packet of information and then a single sheet that is front and back. So you're reading through that packet and pulling out the important bits of information and putting that information down. That must be turned in before you leave today, okay? You also have a set of glass analysis practice questions, which you can definitely use your notes from glass analysis on. Those I don't care if you take home, but I need the hair evidence turned in today. I would like the glass evidence practice questions turned in today, but we are on pep rally schedule, so that shortens our class just by a few minutes, but it might make a difference. So again, we took notes. You need to turn in your hair evidence information packet or information sheet, sorry. Please note those packets are class sets, so don't leave with them. Put them back in the tray that you found them in and then go ahead and start working on the glass analysis practice questions. All right, you know what the expectation is, and I will see you guys when I get back next week. Bye.